I'm Daniel Sheen, station manager for the MIT Radio Society. Uh, tonight, Dr. Casey Kirby Patel is going to be teaching us all about antennas. And um, if you come back next week on Wednesday, Dr. Ronan Hahn will also be here to talk a bit about current advances in sort of terahertz imaging techniques, automobile radars, all the fun little embedded scanning devices that people are working with nowadays. Um, before we begin, I'd also just like to make an announcement for those on the web. Uh, the Radio Society is currently fundraising for the renovation of our station. Uh, if you enjoy what we do, if you enjoy watching these talks, if you think amateur radio clubs are a good thing, we'd really appreciate your support, and you can find it on our web more details on our website, w1mx.mit.edu. But with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Kirsten Kirby Patel. Dr. Patel received her bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 2003, 2005, and 2009, respectively. In 2014, she joined the faculty of the engineering department at UMass Dartmouth, where her research focuses on applied electromagnetics. <laughs> Prior to joining UMass, she worked at MITRE as, as a lead communications engineer. And her current active research includes high impedance surfaces for miniaturizing antennas, uh, crowd, crowdsourced ionospheric research data, and time varying antennas. In 2015, Dr. Patel received the DARPA, the DARPA Young Faculty Award. But with that, I'd like you all to give a warm welcome to Dr. Casey Kirby Patel. Thank you. Um, since this is a radio club seminar, this talk is designed for, sort of built around antennas for amateur radio. I'm going to start with how does radiation happen and how does it work, and I'm going to go through that to um, the basic types of antennas and why they work the way they do, how we evaluate whether an antenna is actually working and what metrics we use to do that. Some of the constraints for the most common types of antennas. Um, antennas are fundamentally, frustratingly limited a lot of the time. We're gonna talk about that and the challenges that we encounter because of that. And then towards the end of the talk, I will get into some current research where we do what engineers always do, which is try to work around those fundamental constraints. And I'm gonna prove that actually everything relevant to you as hopefully amateur radio, radio operators, is a dipole, unless it's a loop. <clears throat> so why are we having this talk? You could just buy an antenna, so you wouldn't have to listen to me, and you'd have a free Friday night, and that would be nice. You could look up instructions online and make one yourself. Um, there are a lot of perfectly respectable instructables out there. You can put yourself an antenna together. You don't need to listen to me. But if you understand how antennas work and why they do what they do, you can make your own. That would be better, right? You can make your own antenna out of literally anything, most things. Um, you can make a chair radiate. You can make a door frame radiate. You can make a bed radiate. Seriously, whatever you want. Um, how do you do that? So. I sort of gave you an outline earlier, but here's what we're starting with. Antennas and radiation. What are they? How do they work? Is this thing working? Antenna metrics. How do we decide if it is working or not? Um, I'll show you a lot of pictures of a lot of common, simple antennas, and we will discuss in the context of antennas and radiation and how that happens, um, why they work the way they do. Sorry, I forgot to get my laser pointer out, and I am a hand waver and a laser pointer to the end. So unless somebody's got a yardstick, I'm gonna use this. Um, small antennas have some special challenging properties about them, and I'll talk about what those are and why they are what they are. And lastly, I will talk about what all the cool kids are doing, among whom I count myself, um, about those special challenges of small antennas. And that was the last point in my bio, the thing about time varying antennas is an approach to the special challenges of small antennas. To start with, antennas and radiation. An antenna is a transducer. 
that converts electrical signals into freely propagating radio waves. In that sense, it's very much like a speaker or a microphone. It, those convert electrical signals into sound waves, one way or the other, in, in one direction or vice versa. <clears throat> An antenna does the same thing, but it converts it into radio waves instead. Um, how does it do that? Let's start by talking about how radiation works from the point of view of a dipole. Um, this is a static electric dipole. We have a positive charge and a negative charge. Electric field lines start on the positive charge, come out of it, and end on the negative charge. Easy peasy. But if this is static, if it's not time varying, if there, there's no current on this situation, we don't actually get radiation. This is a static field. It doesn't carry information. It doesn't really carry energy. Nothing is happening here. If these charges swap between the ends of the dipole, if we put the positive one where the negative one is and the negative one where the positive one is, all of these electric field lines have to flip direction. They start on the positive charge and they end on the negative charge. So instead of pointing generally down, now they have to point generally up. If you keep doing that repeatedly, you get something like this. All of these electric field lines are swapping from pointing generally down to pointing generally up over and over and over again. But because of the limited speed at which information and power and energy propagate, the field farther away doesn't know yet that the charges have swapped. So the information that the charges on this dipole have swapped positions is propagating. And that fact is what's causing these electric field lines to change direction and make these loops. The loops are actually just that the field line has to go through zero when it swaps from up to down. So you end up with the loopy shape and the hole in the middle. That's what it is. So if we use these principles of radiation to build an antenna, how do we know that it's working? I'm going to show you an example that I like to do in my antenna design class. We're not going to do the whole thing because this is a four-week project, but I think you will like it as an illustration of the concerns that we have to address on a system level whenever we have a system that contains antennas. I'm going to read this out loud for you because I think it's really cool. It's a great example. During its last Soviet operations in 1960, the U-2 photographic collection system had noted a very large antenna structure near the Sari Shagan missile test range. We believed that it was the antenna of a new radar system, but since the location was deep within a denied area, we were not able to detect signals from it. Its signals were first heard by Western observers in 1962, not via moon bounce, but by reflection from the ionized cloud of a Soviet atomic test explosion. Since analysis of this brief crude intercept showed that the Soviets had a new radar system of advanced capability, the intelligence community immediately attempted to intercept the signal by other means. The other means that they settled on in the end was to wait for the Soviets to point their radar beam at the moon and then have that radar beam bounce off the moon and receive it on a large dish antenna in California. Um, in my class, I have people analyze the power budget for this system and try to figure out, OK, if you are designing this system, how big does this dish antenna have to be? I get answers between three, three feet uh, to acres. <clears throat> The actual answer, I think, was about 170 feet across, but it was an existing system. So I don't know if that was the minimum possible size or just what they had that was convenient. <clears throat> so when you're evaluating the situation, you're trying to figure out how big does my antenna have to be. I need to know a number of facts. First of all, I would like to know the transmit power of the original system. I may or may not be able to estimate that from my observations of the ion cloud reflections. Hard to know. Then I need to, to know what fraction of that power, assuming that I actually can, there we go, assuming that I actually can estimate how much power that is, what fraction of that power is delivered 
from the transmitter to the antenna. And then what fraction of that power that's delivered to the antenna is actually radiated by the antenna? And then, after it is radiated by the antenna, what fraction of that power actually goes in the direction of the moon? Um, different antennas are differently directive, as we will get to later in this talk. Some of them are pretty omnidirectional, and other ones are very directive. So if you don't point that radar at the moon, you won't get a return in California. So you need, at some point, for that radar to be pointed at the moon. Luckily, they apparently were using the moon for target practice, and they were using it to like test their tracking algorithms, so they actually got a lot of data off the moon. But that might have not happened, and then they would have had a lot more trouble. <clears throat> then, radiation, as again we will talk about later in this talk, um, spreads out spherically from any finite-sized source. So from this antenna, it's got some angular dependence, and most of it is going to go in a sort of conical shape in the direction of this radar beam. But it's still going to spread out spherically. And that means that you're going to have some power loss that is proportional to 1 over the distance squared um, as it spreads out geometrically from the source. So what, what fraction of the power actually arrives at the moon? Then, what fraction of the power is reflected from the moon? Does the moon actually absorb it? Uh, how much of it do we get back? The, I've had different people do different estimates of this. Um, some people sort of make up a number. Some people use estimates of the reflectivity of the moon from similar moon bounce activities that you can do at other frequencies. Uh, numbers I've seen are about 10%. Um, so that's sort of the general consensus that my class tends to come to during most semesters. <clears throat> then, after being reflected from the moon and re-radiated, um, what proportion of that power arrives back at the receiving antenna after being spread out spherically, again, because the moon is a finite-sized radiator, uh, from the moon's surface? Then what proportion of that is captured by the receiving antenna? Much like your transmit antenna, receiving antennas are going to be directive, so it has to be pointed in the right direction, and uh, the direction of maximum gain for the receive antenna needs to be in the right direction of the moon. Lastly, from the receive antenna, during the power that it's collected, what proportion of that power is actually delivered to the receiver? And that's more of a circuit problem of how the antenna works within the system. So our antenna system has some circuit aspects some RF microwave circuit issues of transmission lines and matching and impedance. It has some radio wave propagation aspects in terms of the <clears throat> free space propagation and geometric path loss. And it has some radio cross section, uh, radar cross section aspects. Uh, what exactly is the RCS of the moon and how reflective is it? Luckily, large spheres are pretty well understood, but that's uh, neither here nor there. All right, so the metrics that we use to analyze antennas start with radiation pattern. I'm putting this equation up here not so that you will look at the equation and read it, but so that I can point out its parts. The radiation pattern is the angular dependence of the electric field from an antenna because all finite size sources, as long as you're far enough away from them, behave the same as a function of radius. So everything has this uh, e to the minus jkr, that's where the phase comes from of your time harmonic wave that's being radiated from your antenna. <clears throat> it has the 1 over r, that's for your spherical spreading. This is the electric field. And then it has a function of angle that tells you the polarization of the electric field. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. And it has an amplitude, and the amplitude and the polarization can be functions of angle. This is just an example of what that sort of thing tends to look like. Um, your radiation pattern is, in fact, a 3D quantity. It looks like this. It might, or, it might not look like that, but it's usually kind of a blob. Um, but usually, those are kind of inconvenient to work with and discuss, so we tend to present, as antenna engineers, what we call pattern cuts. This is a pattern cut of the elevation pattern. So that means that we've taken a slice of it like this, and we're plotting it versus theta 
if you're using the same angular dimensions, that, de definitions that everybody use. This is an azimuth pattern, which means that we've sliced it horizontally, and we're doing a plot of it versus phi. <clears throat> When we have a radiation pattern, the next thing we like to do is quantify the antenna's directivity. I have a picture of a balloon here for reasons that will become clear to you shortly. Um, directivity is a measure of how pointy the radiation pattern is. Um, mathematically, it's defined as the maximum power density. Power density is actually a function of angle, but usually when we talk about the directivity of an antenna, we're talking about one number, and it's the maximum of that. Um, normalized to the average power density. So you take the total radiated power of the antenna and you divide it by the angular area of the sphere. And you remove its dependence on radius because both things depend on radius in the same way. What that means is that the minimum possible value of directivity is one and the radiator that has minimum directivity is something that radiates equally in all directions because then the maximum and the average power density are the same. Now, we're not going to increase. We're, this, uh, the top of this fraction is not going to have more total power than the bottom of this fraction. So we're just taking that amount of total power and squishing it like this balloon so more of it comes out on one side than on the other side. That's why I have this balloon here. I use this to explain why directivity is the way it is. <clears throat> same total power squished in one direction or the other. The only way that you can get more total power out of your antenna is to put more in at the transmitter. Metric number two, polarization. Now you remember that that function of angle that I showed when I was defining the electric field, uh, when I was describing the uh, radiation pattern for the electric field, um, had a vector on top. That was a vector function of angle. That is the polarization. When an antenna is transmitting, the relevant thing to think about is that the polarization of your electric field is a projection of the dominant antenna currents. So let's say I have a vertically polarized or a vertical current on my antenna right here in the middle <clears throat> onto the sphere. So it will be greatest uh, when it is when the sphere is sort of parallel to the axis of the currents. And it'll get smaller and smaller. And that is why, excuse me if I go back here, that's why this, which is the radiation pattern of a simple short dipole, um, has a null at the top. There's zero current at the top because the projection, uh, sorry, there's zero pattern at the top because the projection of this current onto the surface of that sphere has no length. From a receive point of view, and this is kind of maybe an easier thing to think about, the incident field can only induce a current on a conductor if that conductor is aligned with the electric field vector. So if I have a horizontal electric field vector and a vertical conductor, Drake doesn't like it. I'm not going to induce any current. If I have a horizontal electric field vector and a horizontal conductor, then I can induce currents on it. Polarization is important. If you have a polarization mismatch in your system, you can put all the power in you want, and you won't get anything. Metric number three. This is a long one, so bear with me. Input impedance. <clears throat> I'm going to have to spend some time explaining to you what impedance is, so if you already know about it, just, I don't know, think about England. <clears throat> From a system point of view, the antenna is just another passive component. It's really just something that you've plugged into your system and you're trying to deliver power to it or get power from it. This is a transmitter because the antenna doesn't have any sources built in and the source is over here, so clearly we're transmitting right now. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, from that system point of view, the thing that we care about is that impedance mismatch reduces the power that you can deliver to your antenna we would like to deliver as much power to our transmit antenna as possible, because otherwise we're wasting it. When we're talking about transmission lines, um, quick show of hands, who knows what a transmission line is? 
Okay, some, some of each. All right, I'll tell you a little bit about what a transmission line is, five second version. The, the five second version of a transmission line is when you go high enough in frequency, the size of your circuit becomes comparable to the wavelength of the electromagnetic fields that are involved. So suddenly, the voltage is not the same everywhere on a node anymore. You can have voltage that is a wave that does this. this is, these you might think of as wires, but the voltage is not the same everywhere on a wire anymore. The current going in is not necessarily the same as the current going out. Transmission lines are the analytical framework within which we analyze situations like that. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how transmission lines work and what happens on them. Um, from that point of view, transmission lines support voltage and current waves. Important facts about this. Fact number one, the voltage and current wave uh, are linked. And the voltage and current have a specific relationship that's a ratio. Voltage divided by current is a quantity called the characteristic impedance. And that's a function of the geometry of the transmission line and what materials it's made out of. Now, if voltage and current, voltage divided by current is already a fixed impedance, what happens when you connect a different impedance value to the end of your transmission line? We're screwed. Actually, what you end up with is, let's say my forward going voltage and current wave, I'm gonna say that's the green one because I think that's bigger, yeah. My forward going voltage and current wave is going along happily having the voltage to current ratio of 50 ohms on this transmission line. It hits the load impedance, gets a different impedance value. What do I do? I reflect some of that incident power. The forward going and backwards going waves then have also an amplitude relationship and that amplitude relationship satisfies Ohm's law as a boundary condition at the load. The, it's a little bit hard to tell from this picture, but the forward and backward going voltage and current waves have the same amplitude relationship to each other all the time. It's this, gamma is the reflection coefficient. This is V minus, the amplitude and the phase. This is a phasor value <clears throat> of the minus going voltage wave, and this is the amplitude of the forward going voltage wave. But because the current waves are related um, by one over 50 ohms to these two voltage waves, they also have the same reflection coefficient relationship. So the minus going current and the plus going current also have this ratio to them. The reflection coefficient is pretty important. <clears throat> um, you can see that the fraction of the power that you deliver to your antenna or to your load is one minus the square of the reflection coefficient because the reflection coefficient is the relative amplitude of the wave that didn't go into the load. Now antennas often have one of two situations. They often involve terminations by an open circuit or terminations by a short circuit. And for that reason, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about open and short circuits. Um, if you have something that is terminated with an open circuit, at the open circuit, the impedance, impedance is infinity because that's how open circuits work, which means you're gonna have zero current, but you're gonna have high voltage, pretty standard. However, because we've set up this interference pattern between the forward and, going, forward and backwards going voltage and current waves, if you back up a quarter wavelength from, uh, you guys good? Okay, if you back up a quarter wavelength from that load, that relationship is actually reversed because in, in the standing wave here, we have a current maximum and a voltage minimum. From a short circuit point of view, we, we have the opposite sort of thing. If the termination here is a short circuit, at the short circuit itself, we have a voltage minimum because you have to have zero voltage at a short circuit. You're gonna have a current maximum, fine. Zero impedance, great. If we back up a quarter wavelength, now we're at a voltage maximum in the standing wave and a current minimum. This looks like an open circuit instead. Transmission line circuits are weird. At other locations, 
voltage and current are not in phase, so you have some complex value of that input impedance. Oh, I didn't define what input impedance is, I'm sorry. Input impedance is, as you might have inferred from the arrows, the voltage and current of the relationship of total voltage to total current at a particular location on the transmission line. So at the load, the input impedance is the load impedance, but if you back up a little bit away from the load, have some length of transmission line between you and the load, the um, input impedance is sort of the impedance of the equivalent circuit that could be used for, to replace that transmission line plus load situation. <clears throat> I'm gonna use a Smith chart to talk because they are an easy graphical way to clarify what is going on in transmission lines. They don't look easy, but I swear they are. What they do are they map the entire right-hand side of the complex plane of impedance onto the unit circle of the reflection coefficient. For passive loads, the reflection coefficient can have any phase you want, but it always has magnitude less than or equal to one. So this circle is the unit circle. This point in the middle is the matched point where the reflection coefficient is zero. A short circuit ends up here. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I need to also give you the guide to the um, impedance. So this horizontal line across the center is the real line of impedance. The outside edge of the circle is the imaginary axis. So this left-hand point is zero impedance. You end up with a reflection coefficient of minus one. This right-hand point, and you get minus one because the voltages have to go to zero, so voltages are gonna cancel out. Um, this right-hand point, point is an open circuit. You get a reflection coefficient of positive one. Magnitude one, phase on the real axis on the positive side. This is the unit circle, and it is also how impedance works. The cool thing about this is if you plot some point on the Smith chart that says this is my load impedance, let's say it's right there, the circle of constant radius around that match point, that's a circle of constant reflection coefficient. And so that will tell you what the input impedance is at any other location on your transmission line just by rotating around the Smith chart. The important thing to note here is that the Smith chart goes around once for every half wavelength because it's a standing wave, so the relative phase of the forward and, going, forward and backward going voltage waves accumulates at twice the regular rate. <clears throat> um, but yeah, we can use the Smith chart. My laser pointer only sometimes works. We can use the Smith chart as a graphical way of thinking about, talking about, representing, and evaluating the impedance behavior of antennas. Um, I gave you, let's see, I told you about the real line, I told you about the imaginary axis. So, devices that have a positive imaginary part to their impedance are inductive. This whole top half of the circle is the inductive side. Devices that have a negative imaginary, imaginary part to their impedance are capacitive. This whole bottom half of the circle is the capacitive side, that whole region. Um, now that I've told you about Smith charts and how they work, let's use them for stuff. I'm gonna talk about how the input impedance of antennas behaves and why it behaves that way. So let's think about an open circuited transmission line again. The current has to go to zero at the end because that's how open circuits are. That's how wires are, charges have nowhere to go. They're, the current has to go to zero here at the end of the line. On a Smith chart, that point is, oh, right here on the right-hand side, just like we talked about before. Here is the current standing wave, and just to be really explicit about it, I have plotted the current on the top half, on the top wire and the current on the bottom wire separately, and you'll see why in a minute. <clears throat> so the current is equal and opposite on the two wires of the transmission line, but a transmission line is both conductors. It's not one transmission line on the top and one transmission line on the bottom. Now a short dipole antenna is almost an open circuit. So let's just take 
if we wanted to make something that was a little piece of wire fed by a transmission line, current still has to go to zero at the ends. So let's think about this as though it is an open circuited transmission line, except we sort of cut it right here and folded the ends back. Now that current standing wave ends on the antenna. The input impedance to that thing, because we've backed up away from the load a little bit, rotates around the Smith chart clockwise. This is probably a little bit more than it ought to have rotated, but I did this all freehand, so whatever. <clears throat> um, all right, so I lost my train of thought there. Okay, so um, yeah, the current standing wave on the body of the antenna determines a lot of things, in fact, practically everything, about the way the antenna performs. In particular, this standing wave determines the input reactance. So our, our antenna's input reactance is gonna be determined by how far we backed up from this point where the current has to go to zero and what slice of that half wavelength standing wave we ended up with. Let's talk about radiation resistance. Radiation resistance is a little bit more complicated, so I'm not gonna talk too much about it today. Um, but here's the key thing. The radiation integral is a Fourier transform, which means in the same way as if you have more energy in your time domain signal, you also have the same amount of more energy in your frequency domain signal. If you have more area under your current curve on the body of your antenna, you end up with more radiated power, which means that you have higher radiation resistance, which is generally considered to be a good thing, <clears throat> if you're assuming that your maximum current is the same. So as an example, if we have an electrically short dipole, remember on my previous slide here, we cut off just the ends of this sinusoid. So the shape that we got wasn't really sinusoidal, it was really just sort of two linear short segments we end up with sort of a triangular current distribution. An electrically short dipole, because of that, has lower radiation resistance, generally considered worse. There's two reasons for that, and we'll talk about the second reason in a minute. A resonant size dipole, we say resonant when we got a nice half wavelength shape and we have the entire sinusoid lump. Um, that's always nice. <clears throat> it also leads you to have usually a purely real input impedance, um, which is easier to match than something that's reactive. So that's better. People like that. This is the thing that, in general, we are trying to do with antennas. But a uniform current distribution would have the highest radiation resistance. Unfortunately, it is not physically realizable. Sometimes we fake it. Um, I will tell you a little bit about top hat monopoles which is a way of actually faking a uniform current distribution, sort of. Metric number four, efficiency. This is why we want a higher radiation resistance. Efficiency is the fraction of the power delivered to the antenna that actually gets radiated. So we have three components. We talked about the input reactance to the antenna, which is determined by the shape of the standing wave and where your feed point is on the standing wave. We talked about rate, this thing is useless. We talked about radiation resistance, which is determined by how much power your antenna is radiating and the relationship of that power level to the current on the antenna. Lastly, we have a loss resistance in this model. The loss resistance is how much power is being dissipated as heat on the body of the antenna because you have something that's not a perfect conductor or not a perfect dielectric. Efficiency is just a function of those two resistance values. So as you can see, higher radiation resistance gets you better efficiency. People like that. Last thing, we're almost done with the metrics and then we get to talk about the cool stuff. <clears throat> Metric number five is bandwidth. Unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for uh, how much, how good of an impedance match is required. It really depends on your system. How bad of an impedance match can you tolerate? How far away is your receiver? Do you know how far away your receiver is gonna be or are you just trying to reach as far as possible? Can your transmitter tolerate reflections or is that gonna ruin it? 
There are a lot of questions you have to answer here. The bandwidth of your system is the region of frequencies within which your system satisfies whatever requirements you set. You can have a pattern bandwidth. Radi radiation patterns vary with frequency, so as you go up or down in frequency, the pattern of your antenna is gonna change and stop satisfying your requirements. The polarization can change. The impedance obviously changes with frequency. We care about that a lot. The efficiency can change because your current distribution on your antenna is also going to change with frequency, which means that your total radiated power is going to change with frequency, which means that your radiation resistance is going to change with frequency, which means that your efficiency is also going to change with frequency. Everything changes with frequency. That's why we care about the bandwidth of our systems. And that's what we mean by bandwidth. What is the range within which my antenna is good? It's kind of up to you. That was the metrics section. That's how you know whether you have made something that counts as an antenna. Because I mean, some things radiate when we don't want them to, like microwave ovens, we don't want that. They often do though. Um, now we'll talk about antennas in the world, the common types that you might see next time you're out in the world. Consider going and looking for some of these, point them out to yourself and say, hey, yeah, that's an antenna. I know what kind that is. First of all, loops. I gave all these examples in terms of dipoles. And the dipole idea starts from the idea of an open circuit and then backs up a little bit along the transmission line that was feeding it and you fold it out and you get a dipole. A loop is kind of the same thing except you start with a short circuit instead. <coughs> um, loop antennas are easy to make. They are pretty uh, tolerant of being an amateur. This one right here is one um, that I actually, I was crowdsourcing a nationwide measurement of the effect of a solar eclipse on low frequency radio wave propagation. And I mailed people boxes, these plastic boxes and a spool of wire and had them build them themselves. And it was mostly kids. So they had to follow these directions. There's no tool use, there's no cutting. These are 3M uh, stick on cable tie clips. Um, we tried to make this as simple as possible, and the point of this design was this is an easy antenna to build, but you get a receiver that works out of it, so that's fun. Um, dipole antennas tend to be a high capacitive impedance, and loop antennas land on the opposite side of the Smith chart, so they have a very low inductive impedance. Um, they can be useful for a lot of things. Monopoles. Another one of the top three antenna types in the world. I'm not putting dipoles in this group of slides because we already talked about dipoles to death. Um, monopoles are just half a dipole where you have some large conductive object that acts like an electromagnetic mirror to generate the other half of your dipole for you. In this photo, it's the car. In this photo, it's actually the aircraft that this is supposed to be on. These, this kind of blade monopole belongs on an aircraft. Um, in this photo, it is your wireless router. You have a metal box or something, or at least a circuit board. That counts as a monopole. Counts as a ground plane. Now, monopoles with hats. Told you we'd get to monopoles with hats. The cool thing about these is, remember I told you that the uniform current distribution radiator was not physically realizable, but it would be really good for radiation resistance? If you have limited height that you're allowed to access, but you can go a little bit out to the side, in the space that's allocated for your antenna, you can do something like this. Now, on these two antennas, this one is a actual, actually called a top hat monopole, and this one is called a T antenna. Um, in these, we end up with the um, higher slope part of the sine wave where it's starting to get towards its minimum, and the zero point on the horizontal part spread out along the, the top of the antenna on both of these. So your zero points are over here, and the maximum of your sine wave is over here. So it gets you more electrical length on your antenna, gets you to a more favorable part of that sinusoidal standing wave shape um, with less height, because that 
the part where the current density is not as big, where the, where the current magnitude is not as big, doesn't do most of the radiation. Monopoles with hats. A related concept is the bent monopole. If you don't have a lot of vertical real estate, but you would really like to have an antenna here, you can use the planar, uh, you can use the inverted L antenna, you can use the inverted F antenna. There are planar versions. The planar inverted F antenna is uh, kind of everybody's favorite. It's, it's the golden child of the antenna world, especially when you're talking about handheld devices. Most phones have this kind of antenna in them. <clears throat> if you are looking at your phone right now, you look around the edge, it's usually around the edge, and you can see a little plastic gap in between metallic strips. Um, that metallic strip is probably an inverted L or an inverted F antenna. The way these work is kind of the same as the top hat monopole. The zero point of your current distribution is here. The maximum is along here. And you have a ground plane here that provides the other half of your dipole. Um, they tend to have sort of asymmetric radiation patterns because of the way that they're shaped. So they'll be a little bit lopsided. Their polarization won't be purely vertical. Um, but they give you a better input impedance and a better, yeah, they give you a better input impedance behavior than just having a short, stubby monopole section without the extension on the top. Um, I do have to say that their radiation resistance tends to be low because they're small. This part doesn't, radiation, doesn't radiate very well because it induces image currents in the ground plane that cancel it out. The vertical part is the only thing that really does a good job of radiating. Same thing with the top hat monopole. <clears throat> patch antennas. This one, we have a metallic patch and a ground plane with some sort of dielectric material sandwiched in between them. That one takes up a little bit more area, and it's a half wavelength long, so I'm getting a little bit outside the category of electrically small antennas now. Um, but it's a really common antenna, and it's really good if you need to make anything that's flat. Um, that one, the radiation mostly happens from the edges of the antenna here and here. You set up your nice half wavelength current standing wave on the top of this square, and radiation sort of sneaks out from the edges under the antenna. Last part of this antenna catalog, and then we get, it, get into some cool opinions again. Um, the other thing that you will see a lot is arrays of multiple small antennas. These are all arrays of dipoles. And the reason that people do that is because they can have increased directivity and also sometimes increased bandwidth. These two are log periodic antennas where all of these dipoles are physically connected to each other with one feed line. And because they're different sizes, um, it actually does have significantly increased bandwidth. This sort of thing can cover 10 to 1 bandwidth or more. It's huge. <clears throat> it's also electrically very large, so we're not going to talk about them anymore. This one is called a Yagi antenna, or a Yagi Uda officially. Um, where it doesn't really have that much increase in bandwidth, but you feed one antenna element, looks like it's this one in this example, um, or maybe it's that one. The rest of them serve as parasitic helpers that help it direct its beam in one direction or the other because of the phase relationship um, between all the currents that are excited on these antennas. So this one is called a reflector, these other smaller, shorter ones are called directors, and it would all conspire to help this antenna radiate to the left. So it makes your whole system more directive by giving it more physical extent. Because, again, the radiation integral is a Fourier transform. So if you want smaller extent in angular space, you need more extent in physical space. And that sort of gets us into the next situation. Um, the next section is electrically small antennas. If you have an antenna that's, I'm going to sort of expand the category into antennas that are half wavelength or less, because half wavelength antennas sort of obey a lot of the same constraints, they just have more bandwidth. <clears throat> um, there are certain special concerns that you have to think about. Now, most antennas are electrically small or resonance sized. 
most of them. If you have an antenna that is not electrically small and not resonant sized, if you have an electrically large antenna, one, you probably already know about it. Two, you are probably a government agency because those are huge and expensive and nobody has room or time for them in their lives. The antennas that are in your personal devices, that are on your cars, that are probably going to be in your ham radio stations, those are all electrically small, unless you have a log periodic antenna or something. Um, this photo is of the very large array in New Mexico, which is a radio astronomy <clears throat> uh, observatory. It is a very large array of very electrically large antennas. So it was kind of the largest antenna I could think of. Most antennas are not that. So small antennas all have a lot of things in common. First of all, they all have pretty much the same radiation pattern because the radiation integral is a Fourier transform. If they're electrically small, they're going to have a large beam width. They're going to have one dominant current direction. And that dominant current direction is going to define where the nulls are in that radiation pattern. So here we've got that donut shape again. <clears throat> and it might be a little bit lopsided if the antenna geometry is a little bit lopsided or asymmetric. But otherwise, you just get a donut shape. If there's a ground plane, you'll get half a donut. Or you'll get something that's sort of just, just this side or half a donut this way. They all have the same radiation pattern. If it's a dipole, the polarization is vertical. If it's a loop, the polarization is horizontal. Even things that look like they are not a dipole or a loop, if they're an electrically small antenna, they're really a dipole or they're really a loop. You can tell by what the polarization is. Is there, in the structure of the antenna, a short circuit or is there an open circuit? Those are your two options. It's a dipole or it's a loop. And that sort of uh, leads to the antenna literature occasionally being really boring because when you're trying to design electrically small antennas, you don't have that many options. A lot of things have already been done. Another thing, electrically small antennas tend to have high reactance and low radiation resistance. They'll usually land kind of around over here on the Smith chart, or they'll land over here on the Smith chart, far away from the match point, and they'll have some high reactance associated with them. So they're going to have small bandwidth. The reason for this is that reactance has a slope. And the reactance that you have to match it with also has a slope. And because of Foster's reactance theorem, the slope of those two reactances is the same. So even if they cancel out at one frequency, they cannot be made to cancel out over a wide range of frequencies. You're just going to be increasing the slope of the thing. And they'll cancel out at one frequency. And then everywhere else, it will diverge even faster from being a good match. <clears throat> you might ask, why would I match my antenna with a reactance then? Remember efficiency. If you add more resistance to your electrically small antenna, which has a low radiation impedance, or sorry, a low radiation resistance, you're just going to drive the efficiency down by a lot. So maybe you'll get a signal, but it'll be mostly noise and you'll end up dissipating most of your energy in the resistor that you've attached to your antenna. All right, so I showed you this in a graphical way, but there is actually a mathematical way of stating this fact that electrically small antennas have small bandwidth. It is called the Chu limit. Mathematically, it's here. The Chu limit states that small antenna bandwidth is at best proportional to the cube of the electrical size. Q is a metric called the quality factor that is the inverse of bandwidth. So Q is proportional to 1 over the electrical size, where A is the physical size and K is the wave number of the antenna. <clears throat> um, so for antennas where KA is less than 1, so that's a little bit smaller than half a wavelength, um, these are considered officially, definitionally electrically small antennas. And we have this limit on bandwidth. This plot is a plot of uh, the relationship between antenna Q and 
the minimum value of the antenna Q that is achievable according to the two limit. Um, they're just examples. So these black dots are examples from one author. The blue line is an example from another author. The green line is another stricter limit, uh, lower limit on Q. You can see that none of these antennas manage to get below the green line. None of them have a value of relative Q less than one because the Q limit is a real thing. This is what we're working with. Now, how do we do the best we possibly can with this? Antennas that approach the Q limit tend to have a lot of common factors. They maximally fill the volume that's available. That's why all of these are spheres. Not because there's anything special about spheres, but because the Chu limit is defined for an antenna that fits within a particularly sized sphere. So because that's the way the limit was written, people who are trying to beat the limit design antennas that are spherical, because that's the best you can do. And they tend to provide a resonant current path length, so you can get that nice half wavelength sinusoid shape on your antennas. <clears throat> um, not really approaching the chew limit, but sort of another example of maximally filling the volume, fat monopoles and fat dipoles, where you just use a really fat wire, also tend to have better bandwidth than thin ones. Don't know why. Now here's the thing. You're all in an antenna-related talk. You're at MIT. You are familiar with Moore's Law, right? The number of transistors on integrated circuit chips keeps increasing exponentially. Um, antenna size, because of the two limit, does not shrink. Antennas don't shrink like transistors. People hate that about us. I'm serious. I've had, I had a conversation uh, with my DARPA program manager at one point where he said, well, how come we can't just well, how come antennas don't obey Moore's law? Now, he's an antenna engineer, so he was sort of complaining more than he was actually asking this as a question. And I said, because the two limit is a real thing? And he said, but what if I wanted a program that would, if I wanted to sponsor a program that would, you know, make antennas 10x smaller? People always want to 10x things, right? Um, and I said, well, I think what you want then is not an antenna. And actually, that's true. We'll get to that later. What you want is not an antenna. If you want something that beats the two limit, you don't want antennas. That doesn't mean it can't be done. Is there a way around this? All the cool kids are doing it. Here's the thing. The two limit is derived based on the assumption that antennas are linear and time invariant in a differential equation sense. So they don't have any active components. There's no gain. There's no switches. And there's no moving parts. What if we just don't assume those things? There has been a lot of recent research showing that if you stop obeying those things, assuming your antenna is a passive device, if your antenna is not a passive device anymore, you can beat the two limit. These are all examples. Um, these two are examples of on-off keying, where you use switches and diodes to for instance, short a patch antenna to the ground plane when you're not using it. Now you have to synchronize that on-off keying with the phase of your carrier wave. So uh, your control signal needs to have information about what symbols you are trying to send. But it can be done, and you can get more bandwidth. That's what this graph is showing. The blue examples are the ones where you're doing direct antenna mod modulation. Um, and the orange examples are the ones where you're not. You can see that the rise time is faster and the fall time is faster when you're directly modulating your antenna. It works. <clears throat> Frequency shift keying kind of does the same thing. If you have an FSK signal that you're trying to transmit, you, instead of building an antenna that actually covers this entire bandwidth, you use onboard variable capacitors to tune the antenna's resonance frequency to match the frequency of your FSK signal. Both of these examples only work on transmit. Another example, spinning magnets. I am not kidding. Um, you can transmit electromagnetic waves by physically moving a magnet. You can't do it very well. You can't do it at very high frequencies. They are literally using a Dremel tool right here. 
but it can be done. And you can measure the signal that is generated by this, I don't know, a kilometer away. At such low frequencies, it's actually really hard to get into the far field of a system like this, but it's been done. Actually, I don't know that they were in the far field when they did this measurement, but that's okay. Spinning magnets, they're a real thing. Um, my work on this topic is about time-varying antennas in receive mode. All of those things that I just told you about are transmit systems. There are a few other ways to do this. They're also all transmit systems. There are no two beating antennas in receive mode. What do we do? Well, and the reason for that is, well, you'll see in a minute. Okay. So, hypothetically, here comes a little bit of hand waving, a little bit of diagrams, a little bit of thinking physically. Let's say you have an electrically small antenna. And let's say that you have an incident signal whose wavelength is too long, whose frequency is too low. What happens in that situation is, at first, when the signal reaches your antenna, it starts to charge up like a capacitor. This being a dipole, it charges like a capacitor. If it was a loop, it would do a different thing. But we're dealing with the dipole. <clears throat> Eventually, though, that dipole becomes a fully charged capacitor, right? We've got that maximum value of that incident electric field, but it can't charge up any more than it already has. Since the wavelength of the signal is too long and the frequency of the signal is too low, the incident wave polarity has not yet flipped. We're wasting energy. What if we just physically flipped this dipole over? then it can move again, problem solved, right? Now our electric field, which is pointing down, drives all these positive charges to the bottom and all the negative charges to the top. Charges can move again, great. How do we physically flip over a dipole that fast? Um, in our early simulations, we found that fast switching can increase the power you receive at your output sort of via a parametric amplification effect. What we're doing, instead of physically flipping the antenna over, which you can't do, um, is we're providing a time-varying boundary condition. Say maybe we short one end of our inverted L antenna, and then we short the other end instead. Flip which side we're doing the short on. Now we have a situation where the charges will build up on one end, and then they'll whoosh over to the other end when the short moves. OK. This project is still really in its early stages, so the questions that we have are, one, how do we implement this? I gave you one example with that inverted L with the switching. That would probably work. But more important questions are, what metrics can we use to evaluate an antenna that's not LTI? Impedance isn't really very well defined anymore. Gain isn't really well defined. What does efficiency mean when we're adding energy through these active components? And fundamentally, going back to the moon problem, do we actually improve our system performance? Is the received signal-to-noise ratio better? That's the key thing. It all comes down to, is this thing working? So that, those questions still remain to be answered. Um, that's an ongoing project that I'm really excited about. It's kind of brand new. And uh, yeah, so. At this point, I'm going to summarize the talk. And the, summarize, the summary of the talk is these three facts. One, the current distribution on your antenna is your destiny. It tells you everything about what's going to happen on that antenna. The current has to go to zero at the end if you have an open circuit. If you have a short circuit, there has to be zero voltage. And that tells you what the current's going to be shaped like on the body of your antenna. And that tells you what the input impedance is going to look like. It tells you about what the reactance is going to be. It tells you about what the radiation resistance is going to be. Current is destiny. Second, radiation is a Fourier transform, which means limited extent in space gives you large extent in angle space, which means wide beam width, donut patterns. Small antennas have donut patterns. They have bubbles. They don't have pointy pencil beams. You need a lot of space for that. <clears throat> also, because radiation is a Fourier transform, 
big, fat, bubbly current distributions give you better radiated power than thin, pointy, triangular current distributions. Radiation is a Fourier transform. Those are all Fourier transform properties. Lastly, signal to noise ratio is the king here. The last thing that we need to care about is, is our system working? And our system is working if it has successfully helped us convey information from one point to another point. And that's true whether it's a communication system or a radar sensing system or even a radio astronomy system. What we're trying to do is get information from one place to another place over the air. If we're doing that, our antenna works. Thanks. Um, at this point, I think we have kind of a lot of time, so I'd be happy to take your questions. Yeah, this is the big uh, early warning radar on Cape Cod. 70 centimeters? I, I think that's 70 centimeters. I actually don't remember. Well, th those of us with repeaters in that band <laughs> have had to huh? turn, set up an antenna that nulls in the direction of the Cape Cod. Oh, I can imagine. already pretty loud. Um, for the time varying receive antenna, I, I, I missed it. Does that have to be, does that switching have to be synchronous with the frequency of the carrier? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Okay. And second question, because <laughs> I was going to add, okay, if it did, there's another yeah, question. Yeah. So if it doesn't, that's great. Second question, can you give us an update on the atmospheric, the, what was it called? Oh, eclipse mob? Yeah, eclipse mob. How's okay. that, well, how'd so, that turn out? Embarrassingly, Eclipse, the original Eclipse mob failed. Um, we had some technical issues with the kits, and so most of our recordings were bad. With the kits or with the kids? The kits. Oh, the kits. The kits, the kits <laughs> that we distributed. <clears throat> um, for those of you who don't know about this project, what we did was we mailed out these do-it-yourself antenna and receiver kits in little plastic boxes. I showed you the antenna in the loop section, um, and we had people build their own radio receivers, connect it up to this antenna that they also built, and go outside during the eclipse. They didn't have to be in the region of totality or anything like that. And what we were trying to do was observe how the ionosphere changed during that really fast sort of day-night day transition. <clears throat> um, and we would get this really interesting geographically distributed, almost like tomographic data set. Luckily, there's another eclipse in 2024, and guess what I'm doing right now? <laughs> so um, the good thing about Eclipse Mob, though, is that it did demonstrate that people want to do crowdsourced projects like this, and people are really willing to build an antenna. A lot of crowdsourced science ends up being extremely basic kind of boring tasks, like classify these photos. We challenge people by asking them to build a circuit and follow some complex directions and go outside and align this antenna so they could point to the transmitters that we cared about. People did it. They were really enthusiastic about it. People used it to, like, ham, old ham radio guys used it to connect with their grandkids. They sent us videos. People designed their own PCB implementations of our circuit and sent us those. They got really into it, and I loved it. So I'm excited to do it again and have it actually work this time. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious, uh, what frequencies were you monitoring? We were, looking, we were looking at WWVB, mm -hmm. um, which is on 60 kilohertz. And we were also looking at um, a Navy transmitter that was specially cooperating with us for the occasion that was on 55.5. So there. Yeah, it is. Yeah, but we are the worst case in the U.S. So most people elsewhere in the U.S. did fine. Yeah, my radio controls box are rusted. <laughs> yeah. So what you've got to do is build a coil and resonate it to that frequency coil around your radio controls box. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any other questions, you guys? All right, well, thank you again.
Um, yeah. Uh, before we end, um, first of all, I think I'd like to make a correction to the intro. Um, Dr. Kirsten Kirby Patel is a professor at UMass, UMass Boston. Right. Um, Don't worry about it. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> um, beyond that, um, come back next week. Uh, professor Ronan Hahn will be here. Uh, if you haven't already, uh, for people in the room, we have attendance sheets that the powers that be for MIT IAP would really like you to fill out. And um, if any of you want to hang around, um, I guess it's a little earlier than we scheduled, but at some point, a bunch of us are heading back to the station over in Walker and probably also going to make a foray up to Green Building Roof at some point. Thank you. And thank you.